Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul and in this Red Game Tetacom video we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which as usual has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with the Nintendo Switch as there are reports circulating the internet that the company are planning to release two new revisions of the Switch hardware. This information certainly does not come out of their field. After all, reports that Nintendo have been planning to improve the Switch hardware have been circulating online for around a year or so. So websites including Eurogamer tell us that their sources have confirmed that there will be two new revisions of the hardware. The first of which is going to be a cost-reduced version of the Switch. However, it's also aimed to take the place of like the, uh, the 2DS. In other words, it's going to be a hardier device, cost reduced, and the basic hardware in terms of performance will be identical to that of the current Switch. So what differences are there? Well, for one, it's gonna have a sturdier design. Perhaps the more baffling change though is it will not support docking. There isn't yet confirmation though whether you'll be able to plug it in to your television, much like the current console, which means that if you buy this uh, particular system, you may just be able to play it in portable mode only, which I guess kind of means it won't be a Switch technically. There are going to be some other changes as well, including the fact that uh, it will miss, for example, vibration slash rumble functionality. But there's also going to be an upgraded variant of the Switch. Let's, for this video, call it the Switch Pro. Now, this hardware is certainly not going to be able to compete with, let's say, the Xbox One X or the PlayStation 4 Pro. Instead, the sources have confirmed it's going to be more like the 3DS to the new 3DS in terms of hardware upgrade. So, let's say somewhere between the 50 and 100% improvement in performance. This makes sense because the current Switch uses the Tegra X1 processor on the 20NM process. Meanwhile, the most likely candidate to be found in the new Switches will be the Tegra X2 and the 16NM process. So obviously 16NM is considerably more bountiful in terms of the number of products which are using it. It will be very interesting to see how Nintendo deal with titles which will run on the Switch Pro and see if there's any titles which simply will not run on the older generation of Switch. My guess is that Nintendo won't want to do this. However, there is also the fact that the next generation of consoles from uh, Microsoft and Sony will be launched over the next year or so. And obviously, we can expect games which will run on, let's say, the PlayStation 5 to be considerably more demanding in, let's say, the CPU and GPU areas. So, if a developer, whether that's Ubisoft, whether that's Electronic Arts or whatever, want to create a game which is targeting, let's say, the PlayStation 5, you can assume that if they want to uh, port that game over to the Switch, there is a possibility that those developers might need a more powerful variant of the Switch to even get the game running. It will be a very interesting next year or so in the console space, and I very much look forward to hearing more on how these consoles stack up against one another. Now we're going to move over to Intel's ninth generation of processors, because it would appear that there is a new stepping for Intel ninth generation CPUs that will launch in the second quarter of this year. This was outed by both Gigabyte and Asus, who have released a BIOS update, or are releasing BIOS updates, for their current motherboard lineup. Currently, the stepping for CPUs for the ninth generation is P0. However, these BIOS updates support R0. Unfortunately, there's no actual information exactly what this stepping does. Stepping could be a lot of different things. It could fix errata issues with the uh, processors themselves. It could be adjustments in TDP. It could be adjustments in clock speed and a combination of all of those. Intel, unsurprisingly, have issued no statement in regards to what this actually is. This does, however, tie in rather nicely to an article that's doing the rounds on Tom's hardware, where the author, Alan, has managed to get several samples of the i9-9900KF. If you're unfamiliar with the KF, it's an i9-9900K, but with the iGPU disabled. Or is it the same as an i9-9900K? with the iGPU disabled, because the author claims that he's had better overclocking uh, luck with the KF versions of the CPU compared to hundreds of samples of the 9900K. Now, just 
to be clear here, this is with extreme overclocking, and his sample size of just 5 9900KFs is pretty small. But even so, it possibly hints that we have one of two things going on here, or possibly a combination of both. One, Intel have slightly improved the silicon of the CPUs, therefore we might see slightly better overclocking for the ninth generation CPUs as a whole. The second theory is because the iGPU is not pulling power from the socket, possibly that is allowing higher overclocks or more stable overclocks when really pushing the CPU to the extreme. And I wanted to report this because it does tie in rather nicely with this new stepping that we're hearing about. And now we're going to move over to several pieces of Zen 2 news, the first of which is the GNU Compiler Collection 9 is going to be launched over the next couple of weeks or so. It will be known as GCC 9.1, and it's going to have several new features, including Zen 2 support. There will be several highlights, including initial Zen 2 CPU support, known as ZNVR2, along with support for a Radeon GCN backend, there will be D language and several other features as well. For good reason, AMD have been very scarce with certain details with the Zen 2 line of processors. Whether it's Matisse or Epic, there are still a lot of questions that are unanswered. At CES 2019, we saw an engineering sample 8 core 16 thread CPU, which had no information given about the clock speed, take on an i9 9900K. And despite lower power consumption, it did actually beat Intel's offering. We saw the CPU with the chiplet, the single 8-core chiplet, and we also saw this, of course, combined with the 14nm IO die. Since then, we've seen various benchmarks emerge on the internet, and we've also seen several uh, AIB partners release BIOS updates for the X400 series motherboards, which offer initial support for Zen 2. The folks over at tankpowerup.com have written a rather interesting article which details some of the BIOS changes which are unique to the Zen 2 platform and Matisse. It would appear that the platform itself for the 500 series is known as Valhalla, and that's a code name that we've heard increasing amounts of over the past several weeks. But there is a rather interesting a conclusion that they've come to. Now, as we all know, you have the IO die, which is going to act as the uh, way that the CPU clusters will connect with the rest of the system. So in other words, data from the CPUs will go to the IO die, and then that in turn will be fed to, let's say, DDR4 or the PCIe uh, devices and so on. But According to techpowerup.com, they are interpreting this that there is also a connection between the two CPU dies as well. And that's where there's a lot of speculation, because ultimately this is an analysis of the BIOS, and we don't have 100% concrete proof yet one way or another. After all, these parts are not released. The retired engineer who put together several schematics which have proven to be pretty accurate thus far of the Matisse platform, Threadripper 3000, and of course uh, Rome, doesn't believe that this is the case. That He does not believe that there is actually a connection between the actual chiplets. Myself, I'm also on the fence with this. Uh, one of the big issues is that it would increase the level of complexity of the design quite a lot, and I'm not sure whether AMD would want to do that. Infinity Fabric 2 has over twice the bandwidth, twice the speed, as the previous generation. So combine this with much better cache, after all, Zen architecture has three levels of cache, and we understand that it's considerably improved for this generation of Zen based upon the benchmarks that we've seen. I have doubts that AMD would want to do that level of uh, complication for the chips. However, I am reporting this because at the end of the day, we don't know yet. Um, this is speculation on all of our parts. So I would encourage you to do your own research on this. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see exactly what AMD do decide to do for the products. And it's possible that they might not have the chip-to-chip uh, -chip communication for, let's say, Matisse, and they may do it for Threadripper, or perhaps Epic, or maybe they won't do it for any of the products. 
uh, from the wording that I've heard from AMD, it would more indicate that all the communication goes through the I.O. controller. But still, it's going to be fascinating to see exactly how these parts perform. I really am looking forward to seeing exactly what AMD can achieve with Zen 2. And with any luck at all, it acts as a real kick in the butt for the CPU industry. But with all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Normal stuff if you did, like, share, comment and subscribe. And I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.